I'm Liv. And I'm Henry. Welcome to The Transcript. This week, The Transcript explores the issues of pay for college athletes, discusses larger societal questions of diversity surrounding this year's Oscars, and sits down with Miss Todd Hunters for the new episode of Humans of Northampton. South Korea reported Tuesday that North Korea is willing to talk to the United States about giving up their nuclear weapons. In April, South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un will meet for a summit. The United States has said that North Korea must make significant steps towards denuclearization before talks occur. North Korea has also agreed to refrain from conducting nuclear and missile tests while talks are happening. On Tuesday, the Trump administration sued the state of California over their sanctuary state laws, claiming they obstruct federal immigration laws and violate the Constitution's Supremacy Clause. Specifically, the lawsuit seeks to block three laws passed in California last year. The laws make it a crime for business owners and local law enforcement to aid federal immigration agents in detaining undocumented workers and residents, as well as set up a program for the inspection of federal immigration centers. In recent weeks, there has been more staff turnover in the Trump administration's White House. Most recently, Communications Director Hope Hicks and Chief Economic Advisor Gary Cohn announced their resignations. The Trump administration has had more turnover of senior aides in the first 13 and a half months than his four recent predecessors had after two years. Additionally, on Tuesday, the Office of Special Counsel found that Kellyanne Conway violated federal law that bars federal employees from using their office for partisan politics in her criticism of Alabama Senate candidate Doug Jones during the election last fall. Hi, I'm Lulu. Welcome to Hamped Up. Y'all ready for this? March is here, which means one thing, madness. In recent weeks leading up to the beloved college basketball playoffs, big-name colleges such as Duke, Arizona, North Carolina, and Michigan State have been in the news over improper recruiting methods, including bribery. Just over a week ago, the FBI wiretapped a phone call with Arizona head coach Sean Miller where he discussed paying Frenchman DeAndre Ayton $100,000 to attend his school. The recruitment process is filled with all sorts of specific and strict rules when it comes to how and when you can approach college athletes. To understand what and exactly why these NCAA rules exist, I sat down with athletic director Kara Dupre to learn more. In my um, efforts to get uh, nationally certified as an athletic director, I had to take a course on um, NCAA eligibility and the process with the uh, with recruiting, if you look at March Madness and CBS, CBS is making millions of dollars off of college athletes, as are um, uh, major distributors of, of gear and equipment, Under Armour, Nike, like all those big names, they're making money off of these kids. These revelations yet again open up the never-ending question of whether or not college athletes should be paid. To explore this question, I sat down with former Princeton and professional lacrosse player and current NHS varsity lacrosse coach Matt Striebel. Your average Division I college football player plays their sport or is practicing their sport 43 hours a week, which is basically more than your average person works in a week. So it really is a full-time job. These programs and these coaches they're the ones that are seeing the money. The money doesn't typically go to the classrooms, it doesn't go to the schools, it stays in the coaches' hands. The stories that we hear about improper recruitment, in, in, in particularly in the NCAA with basketball this year, there are a lot of things coming out about that. And In the sport that I played in lacrosse, those, the violations that I may have seen were totally minuscule compared to an athlete getting paid $100,000. You know, the bottom line is these guys, these guys are, are generating massive, massive amounts of money for schools and universities, and I think it's just patently unfair that they don't get a cut of it. The final thing for me, or the final point that sort of tips it over and where I don't think students should be paid is that your, your number one job is to be a student. So um, I don't think that if you're thinking about money, then you're in the wrong place. The question still remains unanswered and will continue to be a debated topic throughout sports. If you can't wait until the college basketball playoff starts, come support the girls basketball team in the Western Mass Finals on Saturday, March 10th at 545. Thanks for watching Hamped Up. I'm Lulu Kesson. Howdy, I'm Mikey Diaz. 
If you live in America, Arizona and Hawaii excluded, you're losing one hour sleep this Sunday because of daylight savings time. Thanks, Ben Franklin. In other news, Last Sunday, the 90th Annual Academy Awards took place in Los Angeles, California. The event, known better as the Oscars, awards brilliance and success in the film industry. The films are nominated and selected by over 6,000 voting members across 17 different branches of the movie industry. Every Hollywood actor, director, screenwriter, and technician hopes to one day win the highly coveted award. But for some artists, the cards might be stacked against them. For many years, the Oscars have been criticized for being too white or male dominant. This is because, since its founding, the Academy has been almost entirely composed of white men. Admission into the exclusive club must be decided on by the same white men as well. I call Diane Perlman, former special effects artist for films like The Matrix, to talk about the Academy's trends in selecting its films and artists. When I watched the Oscars this year, there was much more uh, diversity as a whole uh, in terms of people presenting and things like that. Um, I think that women are getting their message out more, whether it's Greta Gerwig or, um, uh, you know, any any of those women that are directing are starting to get their, um, you know, their films and their messages out there. And I think that's important, whether it's Mudbound or Wonder Woman or, you know, um, those women are are taking on films that were always, dominated by men. So I think it's an important time. Whether they win or not doesn't really matter, but I think that the Oscars are a stage um, for those women. Definitely in terms of Gamera del Toro winning and Coco winning, and um, I think there was more representation in this year than there ever has been, but there's room for growth. This year in particular, the award show took on a whole new meaning as artists from all different fields look to send a message. I myself can't think of a more important way of communicating because it's a mass media, because everyone's involved in the conversation that films create, because everyone has access to see those films, and because those films speak to us on so many levels, and finally because the artists right now, I think because of the way social media has grown, are gaining more power and more influence and more control over their message. It's no longer the studio that tells the artist how that movie can be shown. Membership for the Academy used to be for life, but starting this year, their voting status will expire after 10 years. If that individual is active in the film industry, they can reapply for membership. This, in theory, opens up opportunities for the Academy's voting body to become more diverse. I'm Mikey Diaz, and thanks for watching. Northampton High School offers a wide variety of courses to students, but perhaps no classes as difficult in its content as History of the Holocaust and Modern Genocide, taught by Kate Todd Hunter. The course is offered every other year, and the content and subject matter continues to prove difficult both to study and to teach. This week, Humans of Northampton sits down with Kate Todd Hunter to get her take on teaching a subject as difficult as genocide, and to tell us some stories about how her career intersects with her family and life. So while we have this interview, we're going to be drawing each other. The whole time? <laughs> the whole time. So what is your favorite thing to teach and what's the most difficult thing to teach? I really enjoy all the classes that I teach. I particularly enjoy teaching about the Mongols and Genghis Khan. Um, and probably most difficult thing to teach is, is probably the, the Holocaust and genocide class. So how do you personally deal with being surrounded by like such negative content in that class specifically? For me, as I've taught the class over years, I've increasingly focused on um, stories of resistance and stories of rescue. What I really wanted my students to see was in many ways how predictable events um, genocidal events are. I really don't want to teach this, this history in a vacuum. I want to teach it in the context of, well, genocide happens today, and it's you know, our responsibility, also our legal responsibility, you know, because of the Genocide Convention to, to stop it. Do you ever gossip about your kids to your classes? No! What happens at the Todd Hunter Fisher House stays at the Todd Hunter <laughs> Fisher House. Okay, this is the deal. You know, I do love some of my children more than the other ones. <laughs> and just like I do 
like some students more than other students, and I do have my really? favorites. <laughs> but the, the, the brilliance of me, my trick, is that I successfully think that convince you that you think you're my favorite student. Is it weird teaching students that are the same age as your kids, like that you have like were friends with your kids and you've seen grow up and now they're in your class? Is like that a little bit weird for you? Oh, well, I've sort of prepared myself for it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's all, it's all good, you know. When I remember the days when, you know, little Levi, you know, would come <laughs> over and, and he would decide to, you know, go like, you know, pee in the corner, um, you know, and I, it's, I think about that sometimes or, you know. That's pretty good. Yeah. For, you know, talking about Levi peeing and the Holocaust. <laughs> you never thought that you would have those two topics in one conversation. History of the Holocaust and Modern Genocide is set to be offered again next year. I'm Ashley Ginsberg and tune in next week to meet another human of Northampton. Thanks for watching. The transcript is looking for guest anchors. If you want to be a guest anchor, sign up outside room G16. Also, come to our improv show tonight at the Click Workplace downtown Northampton for Arts Night Out from 6 to 8 p.m. It's free and you can come for the whole thing or drop by whenever. Transcript.